As a teacher, his experiences are varied, from the role of a junior high school teacher of industrial arts to an industrial arts or a teacher for industrial arts people uh, concerned with the mentally retarded, and also a teacher of graduate courses at South State University. Other educational assignments he has been responsible for are serving as international student advisor, also director of the summer program for international students, and a supervisor of student teachers in the area of industrial education. In terms of his pre professional preparation, Dr. Slugwell bachelor's degrees in business administration and industrial education from the University of Minnesota, where he has also earned his master's degree and his doctor's degree in industrial education. His industrial experience consists of several assignments. One, a designer and installer of heating equipment in homes and industrial establishments. Also served as a bookkeeper and an accountant. In reference to community and professional associations, we find that he's been active in his church, in Raven Church, as a director of the board and also a Sunday school teacher. He's an officer of Pi Delta Kappa, president of the Kiwanis organization, or club rather, in the Romney, Wisconsin, and served as secretary of the Wisconsin Community Action Agency. He's an author of several articles in our professional journal. Perhaps many of you men have read some, if not all of these, published in such journals as the American Vocational Journal, the Industrial Arts and Vocational Education Magazine, and the Journal for Industrial Arts Education. In addition to this, he's been a co-author of one of the yearbooks published by the American Council on Industrial Arts Teacher Education, the 14th yearbook titled Approaches and Procedures in Industrial Arts. This kind of gives you a background of his many varied industrial and teaching professional experiences and preparations. But our main reason for inviting him to be our speaker today is because of his close association with the project underway at South State University, where he is co-director of this project, which has been funded by the Ford Foundation and also the Office of Education. You've heard about this, I'm sure, or read about it, referred to as the American Industry Project or the conceptual approach to American industry. This is one of the big movements we think is underway in terms of industrial arts. And here to tell us more about it in detail is our speaker for the program, Dr. Eugene Clark. I noticed uh, a real 
distressed look on the part of the ticket agent when I told her that this was my first flight by Lake Central. And then I, I realized why she was wearing their slogan, Love at First Flight. <laughs> I suggested a different slogan, Don't go by air if you want to get there. <laughs> <laughs> but in spite of Lake Central, I'm here. I hope to get me home tonight. I want to pick up from what the Dean uh, Dunworth had to say by reading something that Donald Singh had reported when he was commenting on a number of curriculum projects that had been taking place, that had taken place. And he was, he was pointing to a need for uh, some changes in goals and methods of instruction, revolutionary changes, as well as changes in subject matter. He commented that almost all of the projects listed have resulted from a general recognition that the social and technological changes now taking place throughout the world are moving so fast that almost any specific fact or procedure taught today will be uselessly obsolete long before the student who learned this has completed his career as a worker or a citizen. And really, this is what the American Industry Project is all about. If any time today after I talk to you, I hear you speaking of the American Industry Project, then I'll know that you didn't understand what I meant. If I hear you calling it the American Industry Project, just the why now. Then I'll know that the message has gotten through. So that's your test for today. And I'll try to help you out. This is our concern. Our concern is with the dynamics of industry. We want young people to understand this as an institution in our, our culture, which is important for everyone to know. But we don't feel that this is adequately done anywhere else in the school curriculum. And we also feel, because of industrial arts' particular character and mission, that this represents the real purpose of industrial arts. This is where we start, and this is where I expect to end. Some things have been happening. They are right now. <laughs> You'll get that footprint before that is set to the mic. <laughs> Some things have been happening in the school that I think we ought to take a look at. Do you remember this, this list? Where did it come from? Anybody? The seven cardinal principles, yes. Broadly phrased, but they had a real impact on the school. The effect of this was to splinter the curriculum into many small parts, aiming at these broad objectives, and drawing attention away from what we feel today to be the central mission of the school. Along about uh, 1958, when Sputnik uh, was set up, we began to get real excited about our deficiencies on the part of graduates graduating seniors from high school in the mathematics and science areas. And attention was devoted to taking a good look at these areas and doing something about them. The money that were put into uh, these programs, into the projects, uh, researching these programs, kicked off the current curriculum reform. But it didn't happen all at once. Back in 1938, the Educational Policy Commission realized that these objectives were a little too broad, they took another look. This seems to be something that we do periodically in education, and it's extremely important that we continue to do this. They, they felt that our objectives of the school should be to aim for self-realization, human relationships, economic efficiency, and civic responsibility on the part of all graduates. In 1961, after Sputnik, the Educational Policy Commission took their other look. And here they felt that the schools have pro proliferated courses so broadly that they had lost sight of this, the special mission of the school, to develop the rational powers of man, to lead people to understand what knowledge is, how to work with it, how to cope with change, to develop the ability to think, if you will, to solve problems, to learn how to learn. Some things have been happening in industrial arts as well. What are these objectives? Anybody? Have you seen them before? Sure, these are the ABA objectives, aren't they? I've written courses of study about these, developed very detailed objectives. And in my class, I attempted to reach those objectives. And believe me, it wasn't easy. 
The couple of the WI supervisors in 61 came up with a restatement of our judgment. Now you'll notice that they're beginning to funnel down into a, a, a more refined, a more restrictive viewpoint, if you will, but an isolation of our particular mission in the school and our particular mission in industrial arts as well. They said really that what industrial arts should be concerned with is developing an understanding of industry, discovering talent, <coughs> problem solving, and developing skills. We're still riding some horses in here that uh, has given us some difficulty. The American Industry Project, however, felt that our special purpose is to develop an understanding of industry. And this represents our, our total orienting objective, to develop an understanding of industry and to develop the ability to solve problems related to industry. Now, where do we go for content? How do we build a program? We've got to have a point to start. Once we've gotten to the point where we've identified an objective, then we have to go to the content. But what, what are the typical sources of content that industrial arts has gone through in the past? Coming out of progressive education, industrial arts attempted to address itself to life needs to give people the, the kinds of ability to cope with those broad objectives that were, were cited way back uh, by the Commission on the Organization of Secondary Education in their seven start of principles. We've also built programs around process, around tools, materials, or specific occupations. Each of them doing a pretty good job in a rather limited area. But it was possible for kids in our school to take woodworking one, woodworking two, woodworking three, and woodworking four. Now I think you'll agree that this is probably not a very broad slice of industry. Industry is represented there, but it still is rather narrowly conceived. Well, we might point to the total curriculum and say, yes, we have experience also in metalworking, we have experience in electricity, electronics, and drafting, but do all students take these? How about other emerging areas? There's a move in some places to focus industrial arts about the emerging technologies and to set up specific courses in each of these technologies. Uh, Delmar Olson told me that he identified 900 technologies. If we were to set up a specific course for each of these, would we be faced with a, a, a very same kind of a problem that we had here? How about the applications of math and science? The diversion of money to development of programs curriculum in math and science put the pressure on the school. In Minneapolis, for example, the State Department required that a year of math and a year of science be completed. This was a new requirement at the high school level. And the effect of it was to wipe out some industrial arts program. So the industrial arts teachers then got a concession to the State Department where if they could show that they were introducing math and science content into their industrial arts courses, the students could meet that math science requirement. This is a particular impact in that area. But nonetheless, throughout the country, there have been attempts to develop other programs out of industrial arts, utilizing the industrial arts laboratory as a way of approaching these questions of math and science. But does this represent a discipline then, a body of knowledge for industrial arts? No, it does not. Mark Feldman has told us frankly that he doesn't really believe that industrial arts has a body of knowledge, that it is a discipline. And this is the reason why in the Richmond plan we utilize the industrial arts laboratory as a way of making the academic subject come to life. So we feel that industrial arts does have a source of content upon which it should draw. And this source of content we feel is industry. And that we can do a better job of this in the schools than anybody else. You can do a better job of this in the schools than anybody else. But I think you've got to do some things different. Again, our broad objectives of American industry, which give us the direction we feel we need, is to develop an understanding of those concepts which directly apply to industry, and to develop the ability to solve problems related to industry. This is our focus. So we began with a definition. 
we defined initially industry as an institution in our culture, which through the application of knowledge and utilization of men, money, machines, and materials, produces goods or provides services to meet the needs of man. And we stopped there. After getting out and talking to people in industry, we found, no, we've also got to mention profit. So we brought profit in and tacked it on the definition. Our definition provided an initial orientation, but it's been revised since then, read something like this. Industry is an institution in our society which, intending to make a monetary profit, applies knowledge and utilizes natural and human resources to produce goods or services to meet the needs of man. There are some subtle differences, but essentially we, we had the direction that we needed. We looked at industry as being a broad thing, and this is what we're trying to communicate, this totality of industry, so that you can look at the corner grocery store, which isn't there anymore. Let's look at the corner gas station. That's still there. You can look at uh, the farm as a business enterprise. You can look at the uh, service, uh, another type of service. You can look at any productive industry, and you can find that the same general ideas can be applied to all of these if you do have that broad understanding of the totality of industry. This is what I mean when I say, don't say American industry, say American industry. <coughs> We're not trying to teach or develop an understanding of a specific industry, but rather of the broad totality of industry. We'll get at that in a minute. But how, how to attack that question? How to uncover the knowledges that are represented in industry? We took our cue from other curriculum projects. Which a couple of concepts that I'll try to bring out in the next few minutes. One of the most important of these was the idea of structure. The idea that there are relationships which can be made evident and which, if understood, will help you to understand the totality of these subsumed items within that structure. If we could structure the knowledge represented in industry and point out the relationships between those knowledges, we would have our body of content defined, and this would give us the discipline. And a discipline is defined very simply as a body of related knowledges, which also has a unique method of inquiry. So this is our intent, to give industrial arts this discipline by identifying what those knowledges were and showing their interrelationship. This is an important thing to understand. Now, it, it would have been possible start from where industrial art is and to go into these various subject matter areas and to extract from them the commonalities, the common understanding, and build a body of knowledge represented there. But we've already pointed out that these particular areas don't really represent the broad sample of industry that we're aiming at. So it seems to be more logical for us to go to industry itself and attempt to identify what knowledge are represented therein. And this was the approach that we used. But this does bring up another question. And this is the point that structure can be thought of uh, as providing a picture of interrelationship. But it doesn't mean that there is only one structure. For example, take a look at this pile of two by four. It's a, a, a disparate uh, group of random length pieces of two by four. And it has a little more meaning to you than that. But if we establish relationships between each of those pieces, it assumes a broader meaning for us, doesn't it? And we understand that broader meaning because we have an understanding of each of the parts. We know the relationships of the windows and the doors and the floor that, that come about to make a house. A floor in the wilderness of nothing else is not a, not a home, is it? And a window by itself is not a home. So we can introduce order into that pile of two by four. And you go back to it again, and to get to my point, you could structure that arrangement in a different way, couldn't you? And essentially you will show the structure, the interrelationship between those parts. You might have something a little bit different in the palette. 
So what we depend upon is what is our initial objective and what kind of a logic can we structure or utilize in order to bring about the, the most meaningful structure to bring into that understanding of the totality of industry. We're concerned with structure because it, it tends to simplify this broad complex of knowledge. It makes details more meaningful and easy to remember. We can make comparisons and say, yes, this is here, it's like that, therefore I know something about the total structure because I know the relationships of other parts of that structure. It reveals relationships that provide that unity of knowledge. It enables individuals to organize learning for transfer so that when they come up against a new situation, they can measure it against this broader understanding and say, where does it fit? Or where doesn't it fit? Is it a part of that structure or is it, is it not? And it enables students to experience discovery. Because it does give them a powerful tool of inquiry. And this is what we're concerned about in the utilization of structure. <coughs> We started from where we were in our understanding. We brought together department chairmen in industrial arts and the School of Applied Science and Technology at South. And we developed the first initial structure saying, yes, these knowledge of industry can be categorized under these three broad headings, production, industrial management and organization, and service. And each of these in turn will assume other categories, which we felt at that time would represent that body of knowledge called industry. This step was important because it gave us a place to start. This was our initial tool of inquiry. We brought this in. We talked to something over 100 consultants at all levels of management and production. And we asked them to react to this. Some of them wrote papers for us, addressing themselves to the particular categorization system that we had used. And in terms of their reactions, and also the reactions of some scholars in the discipline, people who were at the university level in concern with these areas, we re revise our structure. And we think improve. And I know most of you have seen this one. We said that industry was composed of these 14 concepts. I'll say nothing more about that except to point out to look for some changes. This has changed. Public interest has come out of there. Research and development was collapsed into research. Personnel and industrial relations was collapsed into relationships. Purchasing became procurement. And it's more than just labeling. The basic ideas involved uh, became more and more circular. But we couldn't even get to that point if we didn't have the initial tool of inquiry. In terms of the broader understanding that we had gotten by consulting with additional people in industry, we finally come up with this structure, which has now gone back out into industry. Last spring, we held dinner meetings three nights in a row at uh, New York City, Atlanta, Georgia, Los Angeles, uh, Milwaukee. And what we did was to invite about 15 people from industry to come into each of those dinners. We fed them and then had them react to these structures. This is an attempt at getting some kind of a validation of what we had done. If they couldn't pick holes in it, then we feel that we've represented pretty well uh, what was their baby and ours. What we're saying is that American industry is composed of these, these areas, and this represents a logical structure of the knowledge of industry. These areas are communication, transportation, finance, property, research, procurement, relationship, marketing, management, production, materials, processes, and energy. Uh, it's, it's rather difficult to find knowledge in industry that you can't fit into any of these. And the ball of string is there because they are all interrelated and all interdependent. It is a system. And input at any one point in this system affects all of these other uh, characteristics. We're also saying that industry operates in a broader social environment. We're concerned with government in terms of its coordination of group activities and its responsibility for protecting individual rights. We're concerned with 
private property, our right to own and to use property. We're concerned with human and natural resources. We're concerned with competition in terms of two or more uh, business enterprises being free to attempt to attract the same customers for their products. We're concerned with public interest in terms of the group interest versus the individual rights. And this, this is a question of particular importance today. Industry operates within this kind of an environment. So we need to have some of this understanding, but we don't feel that this is as crucial as the central knowledge that we subsume here. But now this, this is not the totality of the structure. Each one of these major conceptual areas, these 13 now, have through our contact with industry been further broken down to include these sets of knowledge. We're saying that production is concerned with planning, with types of production, systems, fabrication, control. Now I'm going to go through these rather quickly because I just want to show them as illustrations. <coughs> We're saying that transportation involves the means, pre-transit arrangements, transit methods. <laughs> Lake Central, right there. Post <laughs> <laughs> transit treatment. And here's an interesting thought, and it'll help make the idea of structure 30. Control, limitations, regulations by the government, the union, or a company. Watch that control. We're saying that uh, procurement can also be broken down into subsidiary elements, which, if understood, will help you better to understand what procurement is all about. We're saying that the relationship important to an understanding of industry involves these subsumed categories. And notice control, again, is a, an important factor. We're saying that management can also be broken down this way. And notice again that control is an important factor. It's, it's interesting that as you attempt to develop these logical structures, you find that there are key ideas that may occur in many or all of them. This in turn might give rise to another concept and have an effect on our structure. What I'm saying is that there are other structures that could come out of this. So we look upon the structure that we develop, even though we feel it to be a good one at this point, and the best that we were, are able to do up to this time, that it must be one which is constantly examined and revised. This is the nature of curriculum. Curriculum must be a living thing it's to respond to the needs of our, our young people and our society. To give you a little better look at what this means, you start putting it together. We're trying to develop an understanding on the part of young people that management is concerned with guiding and directing industrial activities in an efficient manner. And that management, here's where our categories pop out, is concerned with organizing, planning, implementing, operating, improving, and controlling the productive enterprise, the service enterprise. We're saying that everyone in industry, no matter what his position and responsibility, would be more effective if he did have an understanding of all of these other conceptual areas. The research director is particularly concerned with these major concepts. But there are also some things happening in production or in, uh, yeah, in production or in the materials areas that he very likely ought to have some knowledge of because we are concerned with industry as a system. Now, it, it's a little difficult, really, to separate the idea of structure from the idea of concept, because they're so closely related. And at this point, I've got to move into this understanding of concept, so that you understand why this receives such an important part of our attention. This is the definition that we have evolved for a concept. And we use this tool as a tool for our identifying concepts. It's really an economic definition that we pull parts of from many people. We say that a concept is a psychological construct. It's a mental image. It's an idea. 
resulting from a variety of experiences which are detached from many situations and many particular situations giving rise to it. The concept is fixed by a word or other symbol. This is important. The concept is not the word. We're not teaching a vocabulary. We're attempting to develop an understanding of the ideas that lie behind those words. And that a concept has functional values to the individual in its thinking and behavior. It's useful. I like to uh, use the phrase, concept linking leads to powerful thinking. Let's get that to the heart of the matter. And then to relax just a little bit, and I have a much more sharpened perception of this particular concept today. I'd like to lead you through the development of a concept that uh, each of you holds in to some level of understanding. We've all gone through a somewhat similar experience, yet some other different experience. But we all have an understanding of this particular concept. Many of you may have seen me do this with you before. I've always felt that one of the best ways to get across an idea is to try to furnish an illustration. And at supper one night, I thought, well, this might be a good one just to try it with. Here's what we come up with. Do you remember when you were just a child? Things were going on. Can you read that? What does it say back there? I could break for the door at that. Uh, this one would really get to me though. <coughs> supper time. Whenever they called supper, I was I was first in line. And then you recall those promises that your mother made you. Let's say that you wanted to go horseback riding or uh, out in the country. She said, "Well, we'll, we'll do that tomorrow." But when you're three or four or five years old, when is tomorrow? That's a new concept for Lake Central. But they could be more in depth. And my parents did this so much. They said, we'll do that sometime. That's a good idea. But sometime, you're just closing it off and might as well forget about it. The morning came too soon, too often. And for some reason or other, adults are always pushing you. Always pushing. Why is it? <laughs> they had a reason, though. It was time for us to go to school. And so we began to learn to look forward to school until we got into the second or third grade. We started pigeonholing us into our seats in a little block of time. That's another subject. You're late for school. That happened uh, once or twice. And with the size of my bad hand, it didn't happen more than that. Maybe a birthday began to make some sense, and you could pin down a particular day. Or you use that little bit of doggerel, 30 days, half September, April, June, and November, to begin to memorize a sort of month map. If you date it, you find that the show started in 15 minutes, the pet girl is still fussing around at what I don't know. Maybe she'll get along. And you had to get a job in order to uh, support those Saturday nights out with the girlfriend. And you found that an hour meant money. If you hadn't learned this habit early, it's time to get up, hurry up, you find that you missed the bus, and that you were late to work again. But you soon became an old hand. And three days till Friday, uh, you have know, some relief along about Tuesday. <laughs> or you went to college and found out that it just wasn't time to get married, have children, earn money, do your studies, and have fun too. If you were a photographer, or if you ran and track, you found that you could slice a second down to the minute bit. And really a tenth is kind of a growth uh, measurement. Started. Afraid that we'd come to here. Breakfast in New York, lunch in London, <laughs> breakfast in Chicago, and breakfast or lunch in Chicago, and <laughs> or one more orbit to re-entry. Of course, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about time. This is the concept that every one of us here has developed. But boy, would you be hard to define it. But 
but you've got an understanding of this. That understanding might be a little different from one of us to the other in terms of the particular sets of experiences that we've had. It might be a little different from one to the other in terms of the intelligence level that we might have. Even the, the slowest person has some concept of time. If you were to go into another culture, you'd find that the ideas of time are very, very different. But it's important to know that even though we're talking about concept learning, even the slowest person can learn. In fact, going back to that statement about concept linking leads to horrible thinking, makes me feel very strongly that conceptual teaching is the most efficient kind of teaching. And perhaps that's where we ought to be focusing our attention with the slow learning. We have some evidence to indicate that this is true with the kids that we work with in our project. This particular concept was formed in an unplanned kind of way through a set of incidental circumstances. But this isn't good enough for the school. We've got to develop programs in order to set a program to make more effective and more efficient the time that we have to work with our young people. Let's take another look at what concept means. And let's bring it right into the classroom this time, into the industrial arts classroom. We define cutting as, or cutting with a sharpened edge as the action of removing or separating material by the use of one or more cutting edges. Cutting in general is the transformation of material by the removal or separation of controlled amounts of the material. Now, if we can bring young people to have a broad understanding of what this means and how you must adapt the cutting edges to the particular kind of material that you're using, we feel that this is much more important than for us to focus on 1095 steel cut with an end mill on a universal milling machine. Highly specific, important, yes, important in terms of completing a specific operation or activity. But should all young people be led to this understanding? Or really, isn't this where we ought to be focusing our attention when we have it? You see, we have to look at objectives. And we have to ask ourselves, what are we really trying to do? If we spend most of our time down at this level, developing a very high degree of skill in a limited set of specific skills, aren't we really doing a disservice to that youngster if this is his exposure to industry? Now measure everything I say today in terms of our objectives, that we want to develop that broad understanding of industry that will serve as a conceptual tool of inquiry for that young person in meeting life. Problem. Wouldn't it be better if we focused on these kinds of understandings, the importance of a wedge and the function of it in type, the importance of pressure and angle, material, movement, speed, speed, coolant, and holding. And we find that kids can transfer from one piece of machinery to another and make those adaptations. In fact, in Doug Salton's classes, he had his students redesigning equipment because of this kind of understanding that they discussed. That brings us again to the question of skills. And usually when I have more time and I can work uh, at arm's length with you instead of preacher's length, I bring along a set of, of juggling balls and I'll demonstrate a uh, three ball juggle. And then I'll challenge anybody who uh, can catch but has never had any juggling training to come up and in 10 minutes I'll teach them how to juggle. And the way I approach it is to attempt to develop an understanding that we first need a model performance. Then in looking at that model performance we begin to break the act down into its constituent elements. We differentiate first between each particular step in, in that particular operation. Then we attempt to integrate them and put it back together again. When we get to the point where he's completed his first perfect performance, from that point on it's simply practice and I can leave him. It's extremely important that as an instructor in those very early differentiation stages of learning the skill, that I stay right with it so he doesn't learn the bad habits. What I've done for this person then is to give 
him a model of skilled learning. Now, every man in this room, and the women too, have taught skill and done a tremendous job of it. I'm very proud of some of the skill development that I've done. But I didn't approach it that way when I first started to teach it. They learned each skill independently from the other in terms of a specific set of procedures, a specific set of steps. They did not have this broader understanding of skill science. We had a unit on skills in our first level American industry course, and we found the kids take this understanding and they bring it into other areas, and they do transfer. We've even had students come back and say some of these ideas about math practice versus A practice, for example, uh, they hold for memorizing poetry. So we're trying to develop an understanding of what skills are to make them a skilled learner rather than a learner of a specific skill. The specific skill will become important when there's a particular objective that we want to reach that requires that kind of performance. There's no need for every student in the class to be able to perform the same specific skill. Right? This, whole, this broadens the activities that we can utilize in achieving the kinds of learning that we feel are important. How about the question of attitude? Our approach again is oriented about this orientation on developing the rational power. It's difficult for us to say that everyone must be cooperative. In fact, we have evidence in our society to indicate that we do need some of these dissident elements in order to cause us to re-examine our presuppositions. Now, we can go way back into history and uh, uh, do a, a beautiful job of illustrating this in terms of the discovery of atomic energy, for example. Uh, I don't want to get there because I can't be talked about it. But I have read that this is what happened. We re-examined some of our suppositions and it led to looking at the structure in a different way. Attitude. We try to lead them to understand the importance of attitudes in certain situations. If we have a common purpose, then certainly it's important for us to cooperate. But in cooperation, let's not forget to be individual and to look for ways of improving the system. In other words, we try not to inculcate a specific attitude, but rather to lead them to understand the importance of attitudes in certain situations. Now, very quickly, again looking at some specific concepts that we teach. And don't forget that we're developing these broad understandings of materials, these broad understandings of process, these broad understandings of production. In fact, in our teacher education courses, we're having uh, a play by some of the other departments where they want to use our broad production course and our broad process course because they feel that that's the base that they need for their hyper specialized area. Communication. We want kids to understand that there's a source involved. Mechanical I'll get to that later. That they're related to a system, these, these ideas. That there must be a a receiver, and that unless there's some feedback, the communication really has not taken place. And then as with Lake Central and their transportation system, we have interference. And I, I didn't mean to be uh, funny there. Here's another idea of conceptual learning. Take a look at that model for communication and apply that against transportation. Now, we, we've identified transportation a little differently, but this model, I think, is a very close one to transportation. Something struck me just the other day. I was reading in the Minneapolis paper a, a science, a full-page science description of the weather process, how trucks develop uh, impacting between high and low-pressure areas, and how storms evolve out of these. And it struck me, really, we're looking for, for a model of social behavior. I wonder, really, if the weather map, if the weather problem, couldn't provide a kind of model that we might utilize in terms of the difficulties we have in our society. I want to work on that one there. We want kids to understand that communication conveys an idea or a message. That it makes use of signs and symbols, which are just that, 
They're symbols. They're not the concept of stuff. That it affects behavior, and that it results in change. So what I'm saying is that there's a strong tie, a strong relationship between structure and concept. Really, they're part and parcel. We want kids to understand something about finance. It's important that everyone in this has an understanding. Let's put it together. That there is a need involved, a source, a method, and control again is involved. We control through budget, budgeting procedures which sets the plan against which we attempt to measure our performance and we evaluate. We may finance through bonds or stock. Our sources may be internal or external, or our needs may be for fixed capital or for working capital. And taking another look at that source, <coughs> we want them to know that there is such a thing as equity financing, which represents selling part of the ownership in the company or utilizing uh, internal funds in terms of uh, revenue from sales. We want them to understand that uh, there are external sources, but this leads to a debt, which does not involve a passive ownership. We're trying to develop a broad concept of funding and control and finance, where funds needed and projected needs have some impact on determining the quantity of funds that you need. And that control is achieved through the development of a budget and through evaluating performance against that budget. And that this must be taken into account in terms of our present operating budget and our future proposed budget. Now, let's have a little test. heard this before. What are some of the areas that are involved in marketing? Some of the major concepts. What's that on these books? Well, we, we're saying at this point that we're concerned with the market analysis. We're concerned with advertising, with drawing attention to our product, letting people know what we have. We're concerned with selling that product, inducing people to buy, persuading them of their need for it. We're concerned also with distribution of that product, and of course, we're concerned with servicing of that product. And these are activities which are used by industry to bring consumers to purchase products and services. I don't like to pause here because I don't think they do that. We're trying to develop a feeling for the essence of these concepts. We're not teaching the particular logical structure. We're attempting to develop a psychological structure in the minds of the young people so that they can begin to fit into that structure other knowledge. We want them to understand in terms of energy that chemical energy can be converted into electricity, that electrical energy can be converted into light that electrical energy working with and triggering chemical energy that produce heat which in turn results in mechanical power development. And that the key to all of these is control. Now how about programming? Essentially we could approach this in, in two ways. We could develop a series of sequential units in which we take a look at each of the conceptual areas and study them one at a time, or we could develop a series of cyclical units which bring us through broader experiences that establish the relationship. So we decided that at the early levels this is most important, that this broad relationship be set down first. So we set up three levels of courses. Our first level course is concerned with developing that broad understanding of industry. We feel this can be best introduced at the eighth grade level. That students going out of this class then can go into other classes and make the relationship in terms of our structure of industry which we began to develop in his, in his mind. The principal medium that we've used or activity has been simply adopting the junior achievement program 
And Tom Rice is doing a little bit right here. This, this draws all these together and puts all these other things into context. Have you ever stopped and asked yourself, why in the devil did industry develop a junior achievement program outside of the regular school curriculum? Do you suppose that we haven't been doing our job in terms of leading kids to an understanding of industry? But our view is broader. And junior achievements are concerned primarily with uh, merchandising and with financial accounting and this kind of thing, advertising and sales distribution. We've got to bring into context processing, material, and production as well. We feel that industrial arts teachers can do a better job of teaching American industry than anybody else in the school. So our first level is concerned with developing the knowledge and understanding of the major concepts of industry and their relationships, and developing the ability to solve simple problems related to industry. The second part, and we, we would like that first one required of both boys and girls, <coughs> something like 75 or 80 percent of the nation's wealth is really controlled by women. They outlive us, you know, and I should wonder. We like to have the girls there. We think all young people should have this understanding. It would be nice if we could also have them come back in for the second level course where we would develop in depth each of these concept areas and expand on their ability to apply them to solving problems. The third experience, again, which represents a logical, I think, funneling and focusing, is to utilize an independent research project focus about a particular area of interest on the part of the young person. We sold this program to uh, the Office of Education on the ground that this is to be a transitional course between general education and vocational education. We're saying that a kid who goes through this program with the development of the broad understanding, more depth understanding, and this independent research will be a better vocational student when he decides to go into vocational education. I think I'm running over my time, uh, very quickly. One of the areas, the concept areas that are concerned with is research. And in this third area, you might ask the question, why research? We want them to become accustomed to investigating questions and asking questions, <coughs> to recognize that they can do something about problems and get involved with them. We're concerned that they discover facts and principles. We want them to develop an unbiased and systematic approach to the resolution of problems. And we think that with this kind of a background, they'll be able to operate more effectively and to cope with industry and demand on them. We, we pose model procedures, ways of attacking problems. And they use these as tools themselves and where they can improve upon it, they improve upon it. The overall picture, what are we talking about? We're talking about change. And if any of you have read Changing Times magazine, these charts would be significant. The X bar chart represents changeovers, where one uh, of two objects or uh, needs or demands or whatever, one of two forces, takes over in terms of its proportion of impact. In this case, back in 1914, this is about the time when uh, the auto really became more important than the horse. In 1917, we shifted this country from a rural population to a city population. <coughs> In 1953, this was a changeover from natural soaps to detergent. In 1955, the white collar worker outnumbered the blue collar worker. In 1956, oleo outsold butter. That you would come. <laughs> <laughs> we made it last year, we thought it for the rest of the country. <laughs> we switched from family doctors to specialists in 1957. 
The electric typewriter superseded the manual typewriter in 61. Synthetic fibers will probably overtake natural fibers before too, too long. And I'd like to suggest that in terms of curriculum change, that industrial arts is approaching this point too. We're, we're a long way really from being that, that slow. But I, I detected a receptivity on the part of the teacher in the field that is really encouraging to me. I think all of our teachers want to do a better job. And what they've been searching for is an orientation, a direction. Uh, I think that our projects and other projects that are concerned with developing this body of knowledge that we call industry can help you find that orientation. I think conceptual teaching is the kind of teaching that every good teacher wants to do. You put them together and I think you've got a pretty good package. And now, uh, we still have a few minutes, I think, to go for it. If you want to put questions to me about any part of the project, I'd be, I'd be happy to respond to Okay? Sir? Yes, sir. This is the most interesting presentation. I'm sure that many of us have over the years tried some of these things that you have done. But your proposal, of course, goes much further than many people have done. And it seems to me, and I'd like your reaction on this, that some of the things you propose here are covered in social studies, humanities, part of the economics, and I wonder about the acceptance of this. This implies a very radical change in what we are doing, and probably it is necessary and advisable. This would mean the acceptance on the part of our administrators, the public, Probably different picture of industrial arts. You're absolutely right. <clears throat> and in terms of acceptance, the order might run something like this. Those most accepted are the administrators. Next most accepted are probably the board members when they hear about it in turn. Next most accepted are other teachers. Next most accepted are the students who were brought into the class and they had a chance now to be the school letter education. Uh, and the acceptance are the teachers in the field. But this has been my experience in the past. And it's for exactly the reasons that you're getting now. There, this question of overlap into other disciplines, I think, is one that I'm not the least afraid of. In terms of the objective that I had in mind of developing an understanding of industry, I don't care whether I have to be concerned with something that happens in English. I need it now. And if I have to teach it now, I'll teach it now. Uh, but we are doing something in the American Industry Project that is done nowhere else in the school. We're looking at industry in its totality, and we're attempting to put these learnings into a context oriented about the purposes of industry. This gives it a meaning that you can't possibly get when you get fit to this in other areas, other disciplines. Now, I'm not a great student of the other disciplines, but I have read a little bit about how these other disciplines are organized. And you can't really find a pure discipline in any way. Science makes pretty good use of math. For example, math uh, makes pretty good use of logic. English uh, and social studies really uh, mesh in many places. Now, there has been, and this has been the character of the curriculum project over the last 16 to 18 years, the identification of a structured body of knowledge, discipline-oriented, and discipline-oriented meant that they were organized by a central theme with a unique method of discovery within that, that body of knowledge. <coughs> the move will ahead. Good lad has already pointed out that the next big move in curriculum reform is going to be an integration of the disciplines. And with the attention we've been putting on defining our disciplines, we'll be in a better position to do it than we've ever been in education. This suggests new organization of the school, and that happens. You know the Kettering Idea Program, IDEA program? No, sir, I don't. Could I, could I explain this a minute? Kettering Foundation has uh, attempted to identify two or three schools in each state in the country. They now have about 30. These will be model schools for innovation. 
They're organized about an individualized continuous progress curriculum. I should define that. An individualized continuous progress curriculum is an ungraded approach to teaching which reduces the teacher's lesson plan to an individual basis so that each student can move as fast as he can at his own pace in all the areas of study. Now, it, it means then that uh, a teacher with 30 kids will have kids on 30 different places in their learning, or more, depending on the different subject matter areas. Up in Duluth, Minnesota, Thorwald Edmonds and the assistant superintendent of schools have had them working at the third grade level with kids following instructions from a sheet of paper which tells them, okay, you're going to learn this particular unit in, let's, let's say, a social study. Read these pages in the book. Go to the film resource center and pull out uh, this closed loop film and show the film to yourself. And then sit down with three other students and discuss these questions. Now, on the basis of this, take this test. And if the kids can answer the questions involved in the test, they pass that one little learning package. The construction of packages puts a tremendous burden on the teacher to identify very closely what his objectives are, and then to build the learning materials for him. The idea is a tremendous one, and it originated, or at least it really got the start recently at the Pittsburgh in the opening school under Glazer. And some of you, you may remember when that was planned. So the idea really isn't new. But we have technology now that we didn't have at that time. And it's possible. It's so possible and it's so fruitful that Edmondson was talking about converting the entire school district of Duluth to an individualized instructional curriculum. 